Um, and as part of our implementation strategy, we put in some mandates for inclusion at the community institutional level because we thought without that, we sort of knew without that we wouldn't get very far. So we talked about 50% of membership of community institutions should be of women, uh, that 60% of poor households must be represented in the community institutions uh, because you know, obviously hierarchy and um, the structural inequality is also very much linked to who are the local elite and how, are they, how they may be capturing some of the gains that might be coming through CDD programs. Um, looking at microcredit as well, we, look, we, we wanted to ensure that women make up 50% of microcredit uh, borrowers and also looking at using the poverty scorecard as a tool in which we can identify those households that might need uh, integrated uh, graduation efforts such as asset transfers and skills training etc to try and bring them out of poverty. So we, we really look at the ultra and vulnerable poor in terms of uh, trying to move them up on the scale. Um, Yes, we had some success. So in terms of the numbers, uh, when you look at our numbers right now, we can say, okay, there has been some, some very positive uh, 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 progress. We have 75% um, of our 7.8 million microcredit loans go to women. Um, you know, 14.1 million of uh, uh, the people, which is 49% of uh, our people who are availing our health and infrastructure interventions are women. Um, so 47% of 80,000 persons who are provided uh, asset transfers are women. Uh, 5.3, uh, so 64% of our community institutional members are women. Uh, so they're women's groups or they're, they're part of mixed uh, groups and credit groups as well. Um, and again, sort of across the board, whether it is enterprise and skills training, accessing health facilities, or being enrolled in primary school, we, we, are, we feel we are hitting the numbers. However, we do do a lot of research behind the numbers to try and see what is, what is the situation, what is the status. Um, and some of the things that we've learned, obviously this is very brief and I'm not going to go into much detail, but uh, one of the things we did learn was that women's control over income has not undergone any major change after participation in microcredit, and this is even after the third or fourth cycle of getting a loan. It seems that that loan is more utilized by male members of the household. Uh, so again, this was something for us to look at and to work through. Um, what we did see was where we had ensured inclusion mandates at the institutional level, at the hamlet and the village level, uh, we saw there was a change uh, in terms of perception, especially of young boys who viewed girls and women's participation in the home and in the public space much more positively than, than did their uh, um, elder counterparts. So for example, the men, uh, when, when the men were surveyed who were members of the village organizations, their views and perceptions had not changed very much. But it was the youth, it was your boys and girls whose perceptions has began, begun to change. And, and I think that is really critical when we look at community-driven development and how we are mobilizing communities in the future. Uh, how does youth play a role and what do we need to do now to bring them in uh, 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 to this, uh, these structures? Um, also, the focus on the ultra poor with the asset transfers, etc. Uh, we realize that just providing asset transfers and skills is not enough. That uh, an enabling ecosystem needs to be created, which can allow for households to uh, develop um, uh, uh, better, improved prospects of moving out of poverty and to have access to other kinds of facilities uh, that can be provided to them. A lot of this also links to public facilities. I mean, good health and education. Without that, it's very, very difficult for communities to really move out or to have that, uh, to experience that socioeconomic transformation. Um, and, and what were the conclusions we drew? That sometimes economic improvement by itself does not lead to social empowerment or gender equality. And I mean, I think this is really a huge learning in, the, in terms of we, re, we can't just rely on saying that let's empower women economically because until you're changing the mindsets and until you're really providing uh, equality of opportunity across a variety of arenas, women will still be excluded uh, at a number of levels. Um, and the fact is that, you know, currently where we work, social and cultural barriers continue to make it very difficult for women to participate. They might even come up to the village level, but the minute you get up to the third tier organization level, because of their, their lack of mobility and the fact that they may need to interact with government institutions and all, it makes it very difficult for them to be there. Um, so finally, um, in terms of moving forward, how are we trying to build in, uh, thank you, I'm nearly done. 
how we try to build in, um, what we've just learned. Um, we really, and I think for us, social mobilization, right? This is, we say, the foundation of our, uh, of our work, the core of our work. We need to go in and we need to maybe renegotiate what are we talking about when we talk about social mobilization. I think it is the poverty of the mind sometimes that is far worse than the income poverty or the deprivations that we see. How are we starting to actually try and change this poverty of the mind? How are we trying to build within ourselves also an understanding of of what we need to do, what why inclusion matters and why we need to be as inclusive as we can. Um, and, and I think for us, uh, you know, when we look at governance, when we look at mainstreaming, when we look at the economy, uh, ensuring that not only are mandates in place, but beyond that, I think ensuring that within PPAF, within the partner organizations we work in, and then within our communities, identifying what are the barriers, uh, because there are many, many barriers still in our mindsets that stop us from really believing that yes, women's participation and the participation of the poorest is going to make this change. Somehow we are still stuck in our structural uh, inequalities and then the hierarchies uh, that is very much there within us. And I first will always go back to my own organization and say we see it there and we know it is, it is everywhere else as well. So as practitioners, I mean, I think it is time that we really have a very honest debate about what is going on at the community level and how is the, our worldview actually influencing what is going on at the community level? Because if we are really not believing in inclusion and why there is a need for inclusion, then what, what is it that we are providing to our communities? So um, just some food for thought and thank you very much.